Okay, thank you. Let me again check that the microphone is working and uh, not too loud or too soft. Uh, yeah, well, actually this, for the first lecture on the night after a party, this is, I think, a very good turnout. As, as GR22 last week, the, the party went on till well past midnight. I don't think the turnout was quite as good for the first morning lecture. Uh, so I've been telling you about uh, everything that I've uh, been talking about has been, is, thus far has been in classical general relativity where I hope I've displayed to you uh, that there is really a remarkable relationship between laws of black hole physics and laws of thermodynamics. But things get really much, much more remarkable when the quantum theory gets taken into account. And before I go to the first slide, let me remind you that in the laws of thermodynamics uh, and black hole mechanics, there's a correspondence between mass and energy. And this, even in classical general relativity, is more than just a mathematical correspondence of symbols and formulas, mass really represents energy in general relativity. There was also up to numerical factors uh, because the, you know, we had a, we have a DE equals TDS law of thermodynamics and in black hole mechanics we have a kappa over eight pi d area. These are corresponding quantities, and these are certainly corresponding quantities, but how you split up the eight pi numerical factor between these you know, has arbitrariness in it, but some factor times kappa corresponds to temperature then, uh, and some corresponding inverse factor times area uh, corresponds to entropy. But in classical physics, this is where any kind of physical analogy ends because although the mass is the physical energy of the black hole, the physical temperature of a black hole is clearly by any reasonable definition absolute zero. Black holes uh, absorb anything you throw into it, but they don't, by definition, emit anything. Uh, in fact, you can even, you know, you get into this a, a, a step more deeply, you can run Carnot cycles using a black hole, you know, doing thermodynamics, lowering boxes near of radiation near a black hole. In classical general relativity, you can run a Carnot cycle with 100% efficiency, which is another statement that the physical temperature of a black hole uh, is absolute zero. That's not the situation, though, when you go to quantum theory. And in fact, quite amazingly, black, well, there are, uh, there are like three, or three um, absolutely amazing subclauses of these sentences. First of all, black holes radiate in quantum theory. Now that makes no sense because I said nothing can come out of a black hole. This, I'm drawing here a black hole event horizon. Uh, and anything inside the event horizon, by definition, I mean, this is purely a definition of a black hole and the event horizon being defined as the boundary, you know, nothing inside the black hole is going to influence an observer who I'm drawing here, who's, let's say, far away from the black hole uh, and looking at, uh, at what's going on. Well, you might say, oh, that's... Uh, Classical theory, but quantum theory, all sorts of weird things happen. Well, quantum theory, quantum field theory, is just as causal as classical 
field theory, even though it's often not kind of presented in that way. Uh, and of course, what happens in quantum gravity, I don't know. And what you even mean, well, what you even mean by space-time and quantum gravity and the properties, what a black hole would be and a, what properties it would have in quantum gravity, I don't know. But the results I'm talking about are in the context and the particle creation results are in the context of quantum field theory and curved space-time, where the metric is treated classically, but the matter fields uh, are treated as quantum fields, so they're treated fully quantum mechanically. I mean, you can treat the metric also as a quantum object perturbatively off of this classical background, so you can, I mean, you'll get into trouble if you try to go far in perturbation theory with that because of non-renormalizability and other issues. But, uh, you know, we can talk about gravitons uh, being produced, and that's fine, and they'll obey the same uh, sort of rules as the other, and properties as the other quantum fields. But again, in quantum field theory, nothing uh, can propagate from the inside of the black hole to this outside observer. So how can the black hole be emitting things? Well, it's emitting things because in, in essence, I mean, one way of, put the H plus over here, uh, describing it or thinking about it is using a notion of particles that would be a natural notion for stationary observers uh, outside the black hole to, to use. Now, of course, near the horizon, uh, observers who were stationary near infinity, uh, with that notion of stationarity, if the black hole is rotating, you actually don't have stationary observers. So what I'm really talking about here, uh, well, we could restrict to the non-rotating case, but I'm really talking about observers who were moving on orbits of time translation symmetry relative to the killing horizon symmetry. Those orbits will be time-like at least a little ways outside the black hole. Uh, and with respect to that sort of notion of particles, there are in fact, I mean this is the remarkable Hawking calculation, there are, I mean it's a little funny to draw it this way because particles are really modes of the field and I'm using a particular definition of particles, these things that I'm drawing would be vacuum fluctuations uh, according to some freely falling observer across the horizon. Vacuum fluctuations not any, any particularly different from the vacuum fluctuations in this room that we don't tend to pay a lot of attention to or, or notice. But anyway, the, what happens uh, with a black hole that was, let's say, formed by gravitational collapse. If you didn't form the black hole by gravitational collapse, then you would have to worry about what the proper initial conditions were, because the extended space-time would have this bifurcate killing horizon, and you'd need to have conditions on your state on the white hole horizon. Uh, one of Hawking's amazing contributions in his original paper was to realize that you could get rid of that ambiguity by considering the physical case of gravitational collapse to a black hole. But anyway, you have uh, these pairs of particles, which as I say, alternatively could be viewed as vacuum fluctuations and would be viewed as vacuum fluctuations by some observer falling into the black hole. But, uh, I don't move faster than light, but the uh, one of the particles, one of the particles in the pair is inside the black hole and is always was inside the black hole unless you trace it back to before the gravitational collapse occurred. Uh, the other particle, though, well, may well 
fall into the black hole, most things really close to the black hole do, but such a particle may also make it out to infinity and be observed by this observer that I drew far from the black hole. Uh, so this distant observer that I drew uh, is in fact going to see a flux of particles which as far as he can tell seems to be coming from the black hole. Well, of course, that observer by definition can't see the black hole, but you can look in the direction where the black hole is. Uh, these particles are really seeming to come perhaps from a white hole, you know, in this bifurcate killing horizon extended version of the asymptotic final state, the, the particles are, would seem to emerge from the white hole really close to the event horizon of the black hole at late times. So that's amazing thing number one, that a black hole, well, even a Schwarzschild black hole, let me restrict to the non-rotating, uncharged black hole. Well, anyone would have, that you would have asked before the Hawking calculation would have said, okay, in this dynamical period of collapse, you've got a strongly time-dependent space-time metric. There's going to be some particle production arising from that. And, you know, you'd see some observer would see some flux of particles, but that should go away quickly once the black hole is formed and settle down to a stationary final state. Um, other people that you would have asked before the Hawking calculation would have said, that's what will happen with a Schwarzschild black hole. If you have a Kerr black hole, a rotating black hole, then because of the superradiance phenomena, you actually would get some spontaneous creation of particles. I, I mean, Zeldovich and Starobinsky pointed that out in the paper where they uh, first, uh, the first paper that noted and talked about the superradiance phenomena. They pointed out you would get particle creation, but that would just be associated with the rotation of the black hole causing it to spin down. I mean, analogous to if you had a charged black hole, you'd expect Schwinger pair production uh, that would eventually discharge the black hole and then one would think you would get nothing. Um, in fact, I think the Hawking calculation arose because in Hawking's visit to Moscow, I think Zeldovich told him about this work and Hawking was very skeptical about it and particularly skeptical about what white hole boundary conditions you would impose. I mean, Unruh was working on this at the same time and actually realized that there was an issue of boundary conditions or, I mean, by boundary conditions, I really mean initial choice of initial quantum state, but Hawking really resolved all that by going to the physical gravitational collapse case. And when he did the calculation, amazingly, he found that, yes, you got particle creation. That would be some messy thing that depends on the details of the collapse at very early times. But instead of going to zero at late times, you had this phenomena that I have been sketching here where the late time observer would see a steady but non-zero flux of particles. So that's already quite amazing. But what is even a lot more amazing, and which is and also the reason why this fits in as, in as the last lecture in black hole thermodynamics, what this observer sees, well, I'm putting him as a making him a distant observer, but the, let, let's do the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, if 
their modifications due to the rotation, you know, due to the same effect that Zoltovich and Starobinsky had pointed out and mentioned earlier. That can all be taken into account. But let's stick to the Schwarzschild black hole where this distant observer will see an exactly thermal spectrum of particles. Uh, well, and it doesn't really have to be a distant observer. Any static observer will see a thermal flux of particles. If you're in closer, the, the flux of particles will be blue shifted relative to infinity. So you'll see a higher temperature here by the standard Tolman relation. If you have a star, the temperature of the, the star in, deep inside the star is actually, if it's in equilibrium, is hotter than on the, near the surface because of, by this same redshift law. I mean, that's not true in Newtonian gravity, but that is true uh, in general relativity, and that is true uh, here for the uh, black holes. So that's a second, so that you get a steady flux. I, I said there were like three or four incredibly amazing things all packed into this one calculation. So I don't have a, uh, you know, pre-set list of these things, but just that you get a steady non-zero flux is amazing. Uh, that that flux is exactly thermal is really amazing. And that the temperature of this is the surface gravity is maybe even more amazing because now this uh, dotted line that I drew here uh, has completely disappeared. Uh, and the numerical factor has been calculated as well. Uh, so kappa over 2 pi, now I'm using, well, the h bars, g's, and c's. I think I've set the Boltzmann constant. No, Boltzmann's constant is in there. Yeah, this is a formula, if you stick this in for the Schwarzschild black hole, that involves every constant of nature used in any branch of physics, basically. Well, maybe there are some exceptions, but Boltzmann's statistical physics con constant, h bar, uh, and then, of course, g and c uh, are coming into the, uh, uh, the picture. So let me leave the dotted line here. But, there, but surface gravity over 2 pi really is the physical temperature of a black hole. Now, that's a very small temperature for a solar mass black hole if you put in the numbers. Uh, you'd have to go to 10 to the, well, 10 to the 15th grams or so black holes uh, you know, would be radiating at a, at a, well, you can do the numbers yourself. Choose whatever temperature you want and see what uh, you know, mass you would need, but you'd need very small black holes to get a very big effect. Uh, in fact, black holes would not be, the, the radiation from a solar mass black hole would, in the present universe, be totally swamped by the cosmic microwave background. But if you wait long enough, the cosmic microwave background will redshift, and this will be the dominant, if there's nothing else, falling into the black hole. Now, one immediate consequence that Hawking also immediately noticed is if you just do the back of the envelope calculation of the mass loss of the black hole uh, due to the Hawking radiation, uh, well, it's thermal radiation. It's given by the Stefan Boltzmann law. You're really in a physical optics regime, so you can't just copy the usual numerical constants that are in the geometric optics regime of a body, but it still scales as area times t to the fourth. Uh, area scales as m squared, but t scales as one over m. So 
smaller black holes radiate more, and you can integrate this equation basically in your head, and if you put in the numerical factors, you find the important thing is that a, an isolated black hole that doesn't have anything falling into it uh, will evaporate completely as a result of this thermal emission in a finite time. Again, that finite time is pretty long for a solar mass black hole. The 10 to the 15th grams that I mentioned is what you would need to get this time in agreement with the age of the universe. So if you had 10 to the 15th gram uh, black holes produced in the very early universe somehow, uh, I mean, no reason to think any were produced, but they would be undergoing the final moments of evaporation right now. OK, so this is now the new space-time diagram of a black hole, again, taking into account the evaporation uh, of the black hole, so an isolated black hole. So this part of the diagram is what I drew for you fairly early in my first lecture, where you've got this is the one with the light cones straightened out and the angular direction suppressed. So each point here is a two-sphere, except for this line that represents an origin of coordinates. So this is really a, the points on this line are really points, but the points everywhere else are two spheres. And this shows the spherical outer surface of a collapsing body collapsing down to r equals zero and producing a singularity. And a black hole is formed in that process in that you create this region of no escape. So that's what I showed you before. But now uh, this black hole, well, if it's a solar mass black hole, this is all, you know, 10 to the 73 seconds compressed into a little portion of the diagram. So this is, uh, you, know, not, you know, not to scale, so to speak, if I'm using some time slice here that is going up, you know, in equal time steps, uh, in the equal proper time steps for ob observers outside the black hole, let's say. But the black hole is here slowly shrinking. You can't see that in this diagram because I can't represent the size of the surface having suppressed the angular directions. And of course, the horizon is always null. But here, it's shrinking down to zero radius. And presumably, the black hole just disappears. And again, you'll just have some origin of coordinates uh, some non-singular r equals zero line, and up here, presumably just empty, flat space-time. Out here, you'll have all the Hawking radiation that uh, was emitted by not really the black hole, but the space-time region around the black hole during the process. So this is the picture of black hole evaporation. And I've already put this up on the board, but uh, now we're, we only have one more dotted line in terms of are these quantities physically the same? And we've fixed the numerical factor because we have the exact formula for the temperature. So the kappa over 2 pi is the temperature. That means one quarter the area uh, is what is supposed to, I can put the one quarter in now because I put the two pi in. So does this represent uh, the physical entropy of a black hole? Well, there's very good reason to think yes, but I'm going to pause on that for a minute to just mention that in some sense, this phenomena has very little to do with the black hole. I mean, it does have a lot to do with the black hole if you want to asymptotically flat space time and observers near infinity seeing radiation. But if you, uh, 
just go to ordinary flat space time, Minkowski space time, uh, and look at the Lorentz boost symmetry. I showed you the picture of the orbits of Lorentz boost symmetry in an earlier slide. It's probably as quick for me to redraw this as page back to that earlier slide, but this is what a, you know, this is the analog of a rotation. So, of course, here in Minkowski spacetime, there's nothing special about this event. I just happen to choose that, you know, as my origin to define, to pick out a particular Lorentz boost. But having done that, uh, the these two intersecting null planes in four dimensions, these come out of the board as null planes, uh, those comprise a bifurcate killing horizon associated with the Lorentz boost symmetry. And we can ask, uh, what does the ordinary Minkowski vacuum state look like uh, as far as these accelerating observers are concerned, I mean, the orbits of Lorentz boosts, of course, are accelerating world lines. They're uniformly accelerating. The ones closer to the horizon are accelerating more than the ones further from the horizon. But we can take the Minkowski vacuum, restrict it, to the right wedge that I've drawn, where the Lorentz boost symmetries are, have time-like orbits. So the Lorentz boost killing field is time-like in this wedge. If I take the Minkowski vacuum and restrict it to the, the, the right wedge, I can then analyze it from the point of view of using Lorentz boosts as my notion of time translation symmetry. Um, and if I say this, is, this right wedge is a stationary space-time in its own right, it's globally hyperbolic, it's a perfectly legitimate space-time to apply quantum field ideas to. Uh, uh, I mean, if it weren't globally hyperbolic, there'd be determinism issues, uh, as there would classically but that's not an issue here in the right wedge. Uh, if, I have a no, if I have a time translation symmetry, there's a corresponding notion of particle associated with that. And, I, and that would correspond physically to the notion of particles that would be observed by observers uh, following the orbits of the time translation symmetry, so the Lorentz boost orbits, or in other words, uniformly accelerating observers in, in Minkowski space-time. When I say it would correspond to what they would observe, I mean that you can you know, make a model particle detector, which is some quantum mechanical system that interacts with the quantum field, uh, and you know, it may have energy levels. Uh, the, and if your particle, if your particle detector makes a transition upward in energy, these observers would interpret that as having absorbed a particle. Uh, and I mean, you, and that interpretation is completely consistent. It's the same interpretation as we use typically using inertial notion of time translation. So the, right, in, in this Minkowski space time, we also have, instead of Lorentz boosts, a notion of time translation that extends to the entire space time. And you can, again, talk about what what you would mean by a particle detector that one of these observers would carry and how you would interpret the absorption of a particle. So I'm just using exactly the same uh, 
story here? Well, the answer is, I mean, the, the, the kind of mathematics involved in giving the description of the quantum state as a particle state with respect to Lorentz boosts uh, here is essentially the same problem as Hawking was doing in the particle creation calculation. I mean, there isn't particle creation here. It's two different descriptions. You have the vacuum state with respect to ordinary time translations, and you're asking what is, uh, how is that state described in the right wedge by these accelerating observers. And the answer is that it's a thermal, exactly a thermal state. In fact, there's a rigorous, so the, this, what does an accelerating observer see was first analyzed by Unruh in an, in an attempt to get more insight into what was going on in the Hawking calculations, and that's, so the fact that these observers would see a thermal distribution of particles at a temperature equal to the acceleration over 2 pi, uh, that's referred to as the Unruh effect. But in fact, at exactly the same time, uh, you know, algebraic quantum field theory type, you know, rigorous mathematician type people for completely different reasons having nothing to do with physics were interested in looking at how the uh, vacuum state, really Poincaré invariant vacuum of any quantum field theory would look in the right wedge when using the notion of Lorentz boosts for time translations. And the statement is that it, for anything, it's exactly a thermal state, a KMS state, uh, uh, you know, in exact accord with the Unruh effect. The, I checked, and the Bisognano, Bisognano, Bisognano Wichmann theorem was submitted for publication within about a month of when Unruh's paper was submitted for publication. So these were really done quite simultaneously and, of course, it, completely independently. It was nearly a decade before anyone noticed that there was any relationship between these two. So the bottom line on this is that a uniformly accelerating observer uh, feels himself or herself to be in a thermal bath of radiation at uh, this Unruh temperature, and in fact, in some sense, the you know the Hawking effect that I described. Well, if you take observers that go very close to the horizon, uh, as I already said, their temperature is going to get blue shifted, so they're going to see thermal radiation of particles at the blue shifted Hawking temperature, but the surface, gra as I mentioned in the first lecture, the surface gravity is the limit as you go to the horizon of the redshift factor times the acceleration. So in the limit as you go to the horizon, this formula becomes the Unruh formula. Uh, so in some sense, for stationary observers just outside the black hole, the black hole has nothing particularly to do with the radiation they see, which, however, as you go out to infinity, now the observer, the stationary observers are nearly inertial, uh, and they will still see a non-zero radiation. It's not given by this acceleration formula anymore. OK, so now let's uh, go to this bottom line. So is the area of the black hole the physical entropy of the black hole? Well, this has already kind of come up in various, this question has sort of been asked in various uh, 
forms, I mean, in the question periods and so on of, you know, well, how would you calculate the entropy of a black hole? Well, I don't know how you would calculate the entropy of a black hole until you had a quantum theory of gravity and not just the name of a quantum theory of gravity, but an actual theory that from which you could actu do actual pose questions and, do a, and calculate actual answers or whatever. Uh, and, you know, I, I think everyone would agree that we're not, uh, we're, we're not really there yet. I mean, there is the, this exception of the calculations done in the context of string theory that I commented on in response to a question a couple of days ago. Uh, but again, that's not really taking, you know, the true description of a black hole and identifying what is going on with the black hole. And I think it's really questionable as to whether even the ordinary thermodynamic ideas that I spent a lot of time sketching yesterday uh, in terms of phase space volumes and so on, that was in the classical case, but you know, densities of states uh, or numbers of quantum states uh, with given macroscopic type properties would be the corresponding thing in the quantum theory. It's really not obvious to me that those ideas will even carry over to the black hole case. So I don't know how to make progress on erasing this line uh, or convincing progress, certainly, uh, uh, you know, without physics, uh, you know, taking some major further leaps so that we understand the quantum nature of a black hole fully and we understand also what the entropy will mean in that context. But there's very good reason, nevertheless, by obviously more indirect arguments, to believe that this really is the physical entropy of a black hole in the same sense as you know, whatever formula you have for an ordinary matter system is the physical entropy of that matter system. And that, uh, the argument for that really uh, is, well, this so-called generalized second law of thermodynamics. Because, in fact, uh, although I've written down the second law of thermodynamics in any process, the entropy never decreases, and I wrote down the area theorem as the area never decreases, uh, both of these laws separately have serious problems. So what's the problem with the second law that has survived centuries and no, people have always tried to find problems with it, but nobody's found a problem? Well, there's a sort of trivial problem in some sense with the ordinary second law, which is I can have some you know, bucket of entropy here. I mean, this is a space-time diagram, uh, so I'll have to draw it in time, too, but I can have some box of gas that has a lot of entropy or whatever, and I can just throw that into the black hole. Now, we don't really know what happens when it goes into the black hole, but presumably it goes into the singularity. Uh, Maybe we don't really have singularities in quantum gravity. But anyway, as far as I'm concerned out here, this box of gas is gone. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I suppose part of its world line is still, you know, world tube is still in my past, but this is so incredibly redshifted. Uh, you know, there aren't going to be any photons or anything else after a rather short while coming from here. So this box of gas has gone into the black hole, and if I look around me uh, at how much entropy there is in the universe, I'll find the entropy has decreased from what it was at this early time. Uh, 
you might say, okay, well, why don't you go into the black hole and then you can count that. Well, even if you go into the black hole at late times, you're not going to be able to see in any meaningful sense that entropy. So that, I mean, at least if the singularity is anything and the interior of the black hole is anything like it's, uh, like it is in classical general relativity. So uh, now, I mean, well, when these ideas were first being discussed as they were at Princeton when I was a graduate student, uh, I mean, I, I didn't particularly find the, personally find this troubling at all. I mean, you can do the same story if you take a bucket of baryons or whatever and, you know, late 60s, early 70s, baryon conservation was believed to be an exact law of nature and throw these baryons into the black hole and you have uh, baryon, you know, a failure of baryon conservation. If I count up the baryons in the universe, it's now smaller than, than, uh, than when I started. So I mean, Wheeler was not at all somehow perturbed by that and had the word, he was very good at making up words for things and he had the word transcending uh, the law of baryon conservation. So it wasn't violated, it was transcended. And I think he was happy with that, I was happy with that, certainly that was fine. I was equally happy with the second law of thermodynamics, which I would have viewed as a much less fundamental law than the law of baryon conservation, which I did. Uh, I, I, why not transcend that? But uh, somehow uh, Wheeler was very bo bothered by that and got Bekenstein to think about that problem. I thought that was a really not very fruitful problem to work on. So this is in you know 1970, 71. So this is several years before the Hawking calculation, which was 19. 74, I mean, announced, I guess, in January uh, 74. But uh, anyway, that, that's the problem with the ordinary second law. Uh, but there's a more serious problem with the area theorem once you know about the Hawking effect and so on. So the area theorem is a theorem uh, that is based on hypotheses including the weak cosmic censorship, but that's not the troublesome hypothesis. The, the troublesome hypothesis goes back to the Rechiduri equation, which critically uses this assumption in the argument, uh, and with Einstein's equation, well, there's a trace term, but these are null vectors, so I can replace this by TAB, the stress energy tensor, and this is just a positive energy condition, so that shouldn't be problematic to assume that, or that you know wouldn't necessarily sound, I mean, in, certainly in classical general relativity, that would not be something uh, that one would worry about. But in quantum field theory, uh, all local energy conditions are violated. It's very easy to make up quantum states that have locally negative energy density. Uh, and indeed, that's what happens here in the black hole, and that better happen because you're getting, in this Hawking effect, a flux of positive energy to infinity. Uh, and if you're going to get energy balance, which you are going to get in this, I mean, at least in this, uh, you know, small perturbation of a stationary black hole, you definitely will automatically get energy conservation in the quantum field theory. Uh, there has to be a flux of negative energy into the black hole. And there is, but that violates the argument. And Indeed, I, 
from what I've said, it's already obvious that it's uh, violated because I said a black hole will in fact completely evaporate uh, in a finite time. Its area thereby will go to zero and it started out large. So uh, the area theorem is genuinely problematic. But what Bekenstein proposed is why not add up all the entropy of matter outside black holes to the black hole area, where I've thrown in appropriate constants of nature into this formula, but this is just the one quarter area that's supposed to represent in, this analog in the analogy the uh, entropy of a black hole. Uh, because then, uh, when I throw something into, throw some ordinary matter into a black hole, uh, I'm going to decrease the entropy of matter outside black holes, but this ordinary matter with, you know, nice chunk of entropy or whatever that I'm throwing in will satisfy energy conditions. Uh, and that will tend to increase the area of the black hole, and you don't have to increase it a lot to get, I mean, this is, a, in ordinary units, a very, very large number. So you don't have to increase the area very much in square centimeters to get a lot of entropy. Uh, on the other hand, in the Hawking effect, uh, you're, you are gonna decrease the area, but you're, spewing out this thermal distribution of particles from the black hole, and that's going to have a lot of entropy for you know, the amount of energy that you're uh, spewing out. And again, that's enough to keep this quantity uh, satisfied, uh, this quantity non-decreasing, at least in a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation. So, it's interesting to probe uh, whether, in, in a little more careful detail, whether if you try to do things optimally, uh, you can, in fact, violate this generalized second law. And a very promising way to do that, which Bill Unruh and I analyzed by now 35 years ago, I suppose, would be, well, instead of carelessly throwing some box containing entropy S, and of course it will have some energy E associated with it, instead of just, caref uh, instead of just caref carelessly tossing that into the black hole, slowly lower it into the black hole, to the black hole and then drop it in or let its contents fall in when you're very extremely close to the horizon. So the idea is the entropy that you lose is going to be the same wherever you dropped this box from. Uh, but the change in black hole area, well, you can calculate that uh, from the first law of black hole mechanics uh, that we have uh, up here. And so that's going to depend on how much energy is delivered to the, to the black hole. And the idea is if you lower it to the horizon, the amount of energy that actually gets delivered to the black hole, well, classically at least, is just the redshift factor times the locally measured or rest energy, you know, locally measured rest energy of what's in this box. So if you lower it slowly and carefully, uh, that rest energy should stay constant, but one way you can calculate this is calculate the work done in your laboratory as you lower it, uh, and that will give you this conclusion that, you know, well, if you get it arbitrarily close to the horizon, you'll extract the entire rest energy of this box uh, back in your laboratory, and you'll deliver no energy to the black hole. So it looks like you can lose energy, entropy S, but keep your area change 
again, using the first law, because you've made the mass change arbitrarily small, you can make the area change of the black hole arbitrarily small and violate the generalized second law. So Bekenstein was aware of this issue from the beginning and made argument, tried to make arguments about you couldn't, you'd have, have to have some minimum temperature here at first and then the box would have to be a finite size. You couldn't lo uh, lower it all the way to the horizon. That eventually evolved to bound entropy to energy ratio bounds on the size of the box. Uh, those arguments, and uh, you know, I think don't work actually for this purpose. But there's a much simpler reason why this process doesn't work, and that has to do with, well, the effects that I've just been telling you about. With, well, particularly the Unruh effect here of the accelerating observer near the in flat space time. But what's relevant is the uh, accelerating observer here near the horizon, because if you're going to lower this very slowly, then of course this box is going to be nearly stationary. It's going to be on a very highly accelerating trajectory. And it's going to, from the point of view of the, from the stationary point of view, uh, it's going to be surrounded by a thermal bath of particles. OK. But that thermal bath is not at a uniform temperature because the temperature is varying as the redshift factor. And as a result of the temperature gradient, there's automatically, for thermal radiation, going to be a pressure gradient, which means there's going to be a buoyancy force, just as though you were, you were uh, lowering this into a fluid. So in fact, one of the things I had to do in this paper is look up the original Archimedes preprint on this uh, to give proper credit for where the optimal place to drop the box is, because you don't want to push it past its floating point. I mean, and, but you have to figure out where the floating point is. And Archimedes uh, figured that out. Uh, um, you know, when it displaces its own mass is where the floating point is, and uh, that was part of the, the calculation. So we I think said in the paper that, uh, that this was, when we finished the calculation and got that, I think we had a footnote saying that this was also done independently by Archimedes and <laughs> gave the citation. But if you take this buoyancy force into account, then you don't recover all the energy at infinity uh, that was in the rest mass of the box. There's a little resi residual left over. And if you uh, take into account that residual, it's exactly what you need to keep this generalized second law satisfied. So what am I? Saying, I'm saying that if you take the entropy of matter outside black holes and add a quarter black hole area, you get a quantity that, as far as one can tell, never decreases. Well, what would be the interpretation of this law? Well, this is the entropy of everything in the universe besides the black hole you're looking at. Uh, that must be the entropy of the black hole. This must be the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, I just don't see how could it be otherwise or whatever. So in any case, that is enough for me to erase this line and conclude that there's not only a perfect mathematical analogy, but the laws of black hole mechanics, I think, are the laws of thermodynamics applied to black holes. And of course, understanding why that should be black hole entropy remains you know, one of the most interesting questions in physics, or at least in any of the areas of physics that I 
know about or think about. Yeah, so I've just said the same thing here, that the apparent validity suggests of this generalized second law suggests that a quarter area really is the physical entropy of a black hole. Okay, so I have uh, 20 minutes, a little less than 20 minutes left. That, that actually completes this basic story on black hole thermodynamics, but there is an issue, I mean, which is usually referred to as the black hole information paradox. I don't have any belief that the word paradox should be used there, so I would tend to call it the black hole information issue that uh, is related to this. I mean, it ties, I mean, depending on people's thoughts of what entropy means and so on, it may tie into this, and I thought I should at least uh, mention that. Now, I expected to have more like half hour or 40 minutes left to talk about this, uh, so I'll go through this a little bit more uh, quickly than I otherwise might have. But this issue, well, it has to do with quantum entanglement and uh, That's probably, I mean, if you've taken quantum mechanics courses, you're, you probably have some familiarity with, uh, with entanglement. But if, if you have a system that consists of two subsystems, each of which would have Hilbert space H1 and H2, then the rules of quantum mechanics say that the Hilbert space of the joint system is the tensor product of these Hilbert spaces. Now, what's weird about that and what gives quantum mechanics uh, quite a bit of the weird properties that it has uh, is that, I mean, if all states in the tensor product were product states, then that would be easy to kind of understand. You have this state representing the first system and that state representing the second system when they're together. But you have linear combinations of things of this sort uh, and those linear combinations, well, they might be re-expressible as just a product of states, but generically they can't be expressed as a, as a product of states, in which case, even if these systems are not interacting, so they're not talking to each other, nevertheless, what, you know, what you measure in the second system is correlated with what is measured in the first system, right? This is, you know, the Einstein-Rosen-Podolsky paradox is based exactly on the final state of your, uh, whatever you did, your decay of a particle or whatever being an entangled uh, state. So if you have an entangled state and you just want to describe one of the systems, let's say H1, you can't describe that as a vector in your Hilbert space you can describe it as a density matrix, but there is no pure state, uh, there is no vector in the Hilbert space that uh, uh, you know, will describe, will give you the correct probabilities of outcomes of all measurements. Uh, and entanglement is, I mean, just occurs all over the place. All interactions basically will result in entanglement. I guess I'll possibly say a bit more about that. In quantum field theory, entanglement is even more of an essential feature of quantum fields, and it plays a big role in the Hawking effect, actually, as well. And that's really quite easily seen just if you take a scalar quantum field. This is the standard expression for the two-point, the vacuum two-point function of a scalar field in flat space time. And the expectation of the product uh, goes as one over geodesic distance squared between the events. So it blows up as the points get close to each other. But it's easy to show if there were no entanglement, then the expectation of the uh, entanglement now of the field at these two different points, the field is now the observable, uh, 
uh, if there were no entanglement, uh, uh, then the expectation value of the product would be the product of the expectation values, which is zero. And this is very non-zero when the points are close to each other. So the information loss issue, I mean, has to do with the fact that when you form a black hole, there will be entanglement between the state of the quantum field outside the black hole and inside the black hole. And indeed, this uh, entanglement that I, w th these particles that I was talking about or drawing early on are tightly entangled. I mean, the ha and therefore, what comes out as Hawking radiation is entangled with things that are inside the black hole. But you don't even need Hawking radiation to have a lot of entanglement between the inside and the outside of the black hole. You know, you could do EPR experiments. I already have some stuff here going into the black hole. I could have some other stuff here that doesn't go into the black hole, and I could have these uh, systems be highly entangled, and now I would automatically, without even any Hawking radiation, have a lot of entanglement of the stuff out here with stuff in the black hole at, at late times. So the situation then, I'm redrawn the evaporating black hole space-time diagram, uh, if we start with some initial pure state at some early time prior to the collapse, uh, we're going to, at some later time, where time is some appropriate choice of space-like hypersurface, but if I choose this kind of space-like hypersurface, the evolution from here to here uh, you know, will, of course, give us a pure state up here, but there'll be a lot of correlations and entanglement between the state outside the black hole and the state inside the black hole. So if I'm just looking at what's outside the black hole, that will be, have to be described by a mixed state. So what I've said so far is, I think, not controversial or, well, I guess it would be contested by people who uh, want to try to distort this picture enormously to avoid the conclusion that I'm, uh, that I'm about to draw. But, so let me rephrase that as saying that this doesn't, the, the fact that there are correlations here doesn't by itself, in and of itself, bother anyone that I know. But what uh, causes, what results in controversy and people talking about paradoxes is what happens if the black hole uh, evaporates completely. Because if the black hole evaporates completely in this semi-classical picture, I mean, what you get up here after the black hole has evaporated is the evolution of what's here outside the black hole this quantum stuff here is entangled with stuff that used to be inside the black hole, but now the black hole has completely disappeared, and you end up with a mixed state. So in this process, if you treat it semi-classically, you get evolution from an initial pure state to a mixed state. Uh, so if you believe that's impossible, then, that, then you can use the word paradox, because here is a clear argument that that's what the final state uh, um, should look like. So, and this is what people mean when they talk about information loss into the black hole. I mean, in fact, knowing the state up here, you wouldn't actually be able to reconstruct the initial pure state. There'd be different pure states that would have different properties inside the black hole that could 
result in the same final mixed state. So that is a, for sure a striking conclusion and it is definitely worth asking what, you know, what could go wrong. I mean, things definitely can go wrong because this argument was based on a, uh, on a uh, semi-classical picture where I was treating the black hole space-time classically. I mean, it was evaporating. That was taking the quantum effects into account, but I was still treating the metric classically uh, to get this conclusion. So if, so if you want to ask the question, what could have gone wrong, you know, could something have gone wrong to have given us the wrong conclusion that we get a mixed state up here? Well, it seems to me that if something's going to go wrong, it would have to go wrong in one of these. Uh, I mean, it's useful to classify what could have gone wrong in one of these four regions. I mean, of course, it could have gone wrong in more than one of these four, but, but uh, for reasons I don't understand, if, and this has been going on for well more than 40 years, uh, people are extreme, many people are extremely unhappy with the idea that you'd end up with a mixed state here and are trying to find a way not to end up with a mixed state. So one way you could avoid ending up with a mixed state is you don't actually form a black hole. And that's the fuzzball idea. So instead, so you, in this picture, you gravitationally collapse to some incredibly tiny radius outside the Schwarzschild radius, and then all of a sudden you tunnel into some very quantum uh, configuration. I mean, the fuzzball idea is the prime example of that, and now you don't actually make a black hole although somehow or other this fuzzball emits Hawking radiation-like things, but you end up uh, with a pure state. I mean, this seems to me one of the most radical proposals. I mean, we're talking about a completely low curvature regime here. Why classical physics should just catastrophically break down when it's not break? I mean, the curvatures here could be less than the curvature in this room. Uh, and why we should have some catastrophic breakdown, I definitely don't understand, but this, this viewpoint has uh, a number of advocates. Uh, well, I've said a few things. If, if you don't form it just at the right time, it'll be too late. Uh, and, well, you've got a, a lot of causality issues as well, but I don't think I need to dwell on this. So. Another place where things could be wrong with the, the picture that I showed is in this evaporation regime. So you go ahead and form the black hole, much as in classical general relativity, but then the black hole evaporation doesn't, I mean, people still want Hawking radiation to be emitted, but if you're going to start building up these correlations and entanglements, you're going to likely be sunk. So one way to avoid building up entanglements and, uh, and so on is to convert the, the uh, horizon into a singularity. So again, this is a really, in my view, radical proposal because again, you're in a low curvature regime here. The horizon is you know, some globally defined object that has no particular local significance. We wouldn't know it if we were if there was actually a massive shell collapsing on us at the speed of light and we were actually already inside a black hole horizon. Uh, of course, that would be this early stage, so maybe you don't need quite the firewall then. But anyway, uh, that is the firewall idea is another one that has possibly the largest number of advocates. Uh, so let me not dwell on that since I'm running out of time. A third possibility is that all of the information escapes out in some sort of, oh, well, sorry. The, the third possibility is that the black hole does what 
I'm saying it does, but when you get down to around the Planck scale, it just stops evaporating. And then, so then you have the black hole existing forever, and you still have a mixed state out here, but if you include what's inside this remnant, uh, then the state is pure. So again, I don't really see what good that does you. I mean, it's sort of the issue, the key issue would be, can you interact with this remnant or can you not interact with this remnant? If you cannot interact with the remnant, then I'm not sure what good it did you to have the remnant and say, oh, all the information, it's still there, it's in that remnant, we just can't access it. Uh, and if you, if you can uh, access, you know, interact with the remnant, then these remnants have arbitrarily high entropy at maybe Planck mass energy, so why wouldn't you, you know, thermodynamically they're enormously favored and why don't you spontaneously create those? I mean, so remnants don't have many advocates that I'm aware of. And then finally, maybe you, the black hole does evaporate, but everything that was in the classically described in the singularity comes out in a final burst and that restores the information. Uh, this is actually an idea that I've been looking at carefully myself. I mean, there's a nice model with moving mirrors of uh, Hoda Schutzhold and Unruh uh, in a paper several years ago uh, where you would get Hawking radiation but end up with a pure state. Uh, but in fact, one can show, I, I can show that although you're eff effectively getting entanglement with vacuum fluctuations, uh, uh, you have to admit real inertial particles in this, in this process. And again, the usual arguments against bursts as having too much, needing too much energy to carry off the information, I believe really do apply even with this uh, modified idea uh, arising from the Hoda Schutzold and Unruh work. So why do people not believe in information loss, I mean, given that the semi-classical theory predicts it, and, uh, you know, it's really hard, I think, if I haven't shown you that it's impossible, I think I have shown you that it's not going to be easy to modify the semi-classical picture in a reasonable way to, to get it. Well, the reasons I've heard over the last 40 years have to do, well, three things. Uh, that the first statement is that this information loss violates unitarity. Let's see, I think I'm gonna run about three minutes over. Uh, I'll finish this up quickly, but I realize I'm at the legal end of my time, but I think you might wanna hear some of this. So the trouble is that uh, unitarity is used in two different senses. It's used to mean conservation of probability, and if we had a failure of conservation of probability, I, that's bad. Uh, but that's not what's being proposed. Uh, here we're just talking about uh, pure states evolving to mixed states. And if your final state is described on something that's not a Cauchy surface, you'd expect it to be mixed. And that's not a violation of quantum mechanics, that's a prediction of quantum mechanics. So if you evolve in flat space time, uh, massless scalar field from a uh, usual t equals zero slice, but now to a hyperboloidal slice that runs off to null infinity. The evolution is perfectly well defined, but the state on this hyperboloidal slice uh, will be a mixed state, and that's the kind of thing that's going on in the black hole evaporation, and I'm not sure now you're entangled with radiation that went off to infinity prior to the time of the slice, but I don't see the problem. There have been arguments of that if you had pure states evolving to mixed states, you'd have failure of energy and momentum conservation. I mean, a paper of Banks, Peskin, and Susskind uh, is widely quoted as showing that, and I mean, they're 
paper is fine, but their model is a kind of Markovian process where there's no memory of previous uh, behavior in the evolution. Uh, I mean, it's the Lindblad equation is what they're uh, uh, using. You can make up other model evolutions, and in fact, Unruh has given a nice model with a hidden spin system uh, where you'll get for your quantum system evolution from a pure state to a mixed state uh, with no violation of, you know, with exact energy conservation holding. So I don't really see that as an issue. And finally, I mean, in the last 20 years, the main argument that there has to be information loss, uh, that there can't be information loss, there has to be something going on that gives you a pure state at the end is the, this ADS CFT correspondence. And I think since I'm gone my extra three minutes that I've already said, I, I'll just say on this that, uh, you know, there are a lot of implicit assumptions in these ADS CFT arguments, like ones that I've uh, listed here. And if you took various of these assumptions literally and applied them to classical general relativity, you would get results that are blatantly wrong. Uh, so, I mean, I think a lot of work really needs to be done uh, to make the AS ADS CFT arguments into a genuine argument that, I mean, something in the nature of a proof or whatever that, that if the, well, first you've got to really formulate the ADS-CFT idea, but then after formulating it, you know, under the assumption that that's true, a, a proof that black hole evaporation can't take you from pure state to mixed state, I think is really very much called for rather than just saying, oh, quantum gravity has to be equivalent to some conformal field theory, and conformal field theories are unitary, so gravity has to be unitary, so a black hole can't end up in a mixed state uh, after it eva I mean, the final state after black hole evaporation can't be a mixed state. So I'm, for the time being, until this, uh, some explanation is given as to how information is regained, I'm definitely sticking with information loss. But the main conclusion of the whole four lectures is that I think I've shown, as I hope I've uh, shown you with four lectures worth of pretty packed in material, there's really an amazing connection between gravity, quantum theory, and thermodynamics. And we're certainly not at the end of the story. And I expect more major insights to come in the future. Okay, so thank you.